World Vision is one of the largest, if not the largest, NGOs in the world. Is the world a good place? I think it is. It's a very good place. And while at times we really focus on what's still wrong or what needs to be improved or fixed, we really have made tremendous progress. Uh, when you think of examples of the progress we've made in the area of polio uh, eradication, uh, we've 120 countries down to three. Um, when you look at maternal uh, health and uh, maternal mor mortality, rates being cut in half, um, that child or you know uh, being pregnant and, and having a child isn't as nearly as dangerous as it was five or ten years ago. So there's some real progress that's been made that we're very excited about. We think there's more work to be done. So this is the, maybe the time to pause and take a big break, but to say that a lot of progress has been made, but there's more work that needs to be done. Well, so what do you think, what's the next thing? I know that the Millennium Development Goals have changed. Uh, they've changed more to be development uh, right. oriented. Right. Right. Is that a good thing? It is. Um, and then thinking of the sustainable uh, development goals so that we can in fact achieve sustainably the progress we need, particularly in the, the hard to reach places. Increasingly, World Vision is working in what we would categorize as fragile states or fragile contexts. Mm -hmm. um, what South, does fragile mean? Fragile means that there isn't in place the um, uh, stable, resilient, strong governance. Um, there aren't um, government institutions such as ministries of health and ministries of education that are reaching out into the entire uh, population in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And that's an area where World Vision is working to help, as we say, reach every last one uh, in that every last mile uh, mm -hmm. challenge. Is your focus more health or more poverty or both? We see them as very connected. Um, World Vision has an, an approach towards the, the, the puzzle of poverty or solving the, the challenge of extreme poverty. It's really focusing in five areas, the first of which is in water sanitation and health, and then uh, in hygiene, excuse me. Uh, the second area is the area of, of health and nutrition. The third is, is food security, and uh, the fourth is education, and the fifth is economic empowerment and economic development. So we think eradicating extreme poverty isn't um, going to be accomplished through one or only one of those sectors, but it's really an integrated approach across those five. Most of the people that I talk with on this topic of eradicating global poverty or extreme poverty, they say you got to start with the girls. Is that where World Vision is as well? We, we are very focused on what we think of as, as gender equity, so that girls and women, but boys and men, are, are all together um, thriving. Um, we've learned the hard way through our 65 years of history that if you focus too much on one group, and it could be a community excluding other communities, it could be on a gender excluding the other gender, you end up actually creating more social tension and you put in harm's way the individuals that uh, you were working to help in the first case. Mm -hmm. So uh, really speaking to gender equity um, is really, I think, a, a critical learning that we've come. So yes, we're focused on girls and women, but we're also focused on boys and, and men as well, because it's really the, sol the sustainable solutions we're looking for involve the boys and men as well as uh, working with girls and, and women. There are so many countries around the world where there is armed conflict right now. Can you work there to bring about poverty alleviation in the middle of a war zone? I think it's very difficult and very challenging. I would distinguish, between, and I'm going to suggest Mosul. Um, World Vision is outside of Mosul. Uh, we are supporting those in need who are fleeing from that conflict area. Um, similarly, we're working inside of Syria. Uh, You're working in Syria? In Syria, near wow. Aleppo, where we're, we're working with what I would call dire circumstances where it's relief um, and um, life-saving relief uh, interventions. We're not looking at poverty eradication so much as really helping someone who is fleeing to survive today into tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it's only when there's a, a level of stability in their situation that um, I think those development uh, steps and programs can be implemented. Well, how do you get somebody who's willing to go over there and do this kind of relief work? I mean, my gosh, the second that you step off the plane to get anywhere close to there, your life's in danger, isn't it? It is. I think part of, of what distinguishes World Vision is 
the, the staff on the ground um, is in 95% of the cases, the staff on the ground is working in the country where they were born. This is their native country. So they have tremendous resources to draw upon and networks and just skills and capacity. So it's not as if um, you or I are gonna be asked to fly over and be dropped into um, uh, an Aleppo relief station. Um, but we're working with Syrian staff who are getting that work done. Similarly in Lebanon and in Jordan, the work we're doing in northern Iraq, again, we're leveraging um, World Vision staff and World Vision partners. And I think this is where World Vision has, because of our history, and because uh, we're a faith-based organization, I think we have a, an advantage in that in Sierra Leone, for example, with the outbreak of Ebola, we were working with and through the Muslim imams, and, and we were bringing um, do's and don'ts as it relates to Ebola transmission into the mosque, into the worship services. We even had situations where we had um, Christian pastors visiting with imams in community settings so that everyone was hearing the same news with regard to how um, Ebola is transmitted and also to hear about a new um, and improved safe uh, but dignified burial process so that people could retain uh, their uh, religious values and their faith tradition but they could adapt and adjust those burials of the Ebola victims so that they were buried safely without transmitting Ebola to their family members. Wow, that sounds like very, very sensitive work to do. It really is, and I think um, at times in the West and in the U.S. in particular, we're, we're maybe reluctant to talk about faith values and, and faith frameworks, but 80% uh, of, of the world um, is operating, I think, from a faith perspective. And so to ignore that um, community or to ignore faith leaders and ignore uh, faith values, um, I think uh, puts at peril the very relief and uh, development uh, programs uh, that we're working to put into place. So. We're here at the Global Washington Conference uh, here in 2016, and it's focused on partnerships, partnerships between NGOs and uh, largely for-profit entities. Mm -hmm. um, World Vision works in partnership with lots of for-profit entities. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, we were talking about water earlier today here at the conference, and we're fortunate to have ex extensive partnerships with corporations like Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. um, with Kohler, uh, with a variety of, of organizations, corporations that are working with us. Grunfoss, uh, the largest uh, pump manufacturer in the world, is one of our partners with whom we're working. We're also working with a lot of other organizations, um, organizations like Sesame Street, uh, developing curriculum for young children to learn about hand washing and how important it is in terms of, uh, of uh, sanitation and hygiene. Um, it's not just clean water, but you gotta keep the water clean and proper sanitation and hygiene as a way of so, doing that. So and to have Sesame Street teaching that. So Oscar the Grouch is everywhere else too? We, we have, uh, he is in over 100 countries if I'm not oh mistaken. <laughs> but fueled by an innovation that the Gates Foundation funded, Sesame Street created a new character called Raya. And she's a six-year-old Muppet. And it's really exciting to have a six-year-old Muppet who's teaching young boys and girls about hand washing. And a six-year-old girl who has no hesitate to talk about pooping and going to the bathroom, etc., in, in very specific uh, details so that these children can learn. And there's another twist to this, as you think of it, this is a girl Muppet, back to gender equity. Mm -hmm. So you have a girl teaching girls and boys about the importance of hand washing and sanitation and hygiene. And that, that brings a great moment of, of gender equity that yes, girls can learn from boys and boys can learn from girls. So there's a great kind of modeling of that gender equity in the curriculum just and through the personality and, and the um, uh, female gender of Raya uh, the Muppet. So well, you make it sound like going into some of the most difficult places in the world is actually kind of fun. It's incredibly exciting. Um, I've traveled uh, many parts of the world and I've been really excited to um, see just how resourceful um, uh, communities are and families are in developing countries. You know, we've joked that uh, with two popsicle sticks and a jar of glitter, um, in a developing company, a country, a community could put on a Broadway show. Uh, they're so resourceful. And it's great to see that with a little bit of encouragement and help and resources, they can in fact then take hold 
and uh, really change and transform their communities as it relates to education, as it relates to health, and some of these other areas we're talking about. And if people want to learn more about your programs, we're going to make sure that the website's up on the screen. So, Super. So Dave, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.